I'm here to talk to you about um, the title says flow batteries and the dispatchable renewables mix, but really about uh, my view about where the grid's heading, where technologies, including but not limited to flow batteries, fit into that, um, and really about about a sense of both signposts and challenges in the journey that, that we're likely to undertake together in that future grid. I'm going to start out by explaining what a flow battery is, and obviously I've got a, a reason for doing that. I'm involved with a flow battery company. But flow batteries, I think I want to explain what they do in general so you can understand where they fit into the, into the mix of these things. Flow batteries are quite an unusual device. They, they've been around for a long time, but most people haven't seen them. And the reason they haven't seen them is that most flow batteries are very, very big things, contain, shipping container size things. That's not a bad thing, but it means you're unlikely generally to find them in a house, at least until we turned up. So here's the things that flow batteries do that are a bit special and that are worth bearing in mind. Flow batteries, unlike conventional batteries, they don't lose output capacity with age. Those of you that have owned any sort of mobile device will understand that lithium batteries or lead-acid batteries or any other sort of battery, the more you use them, the more they wear out and the more their capacity diminishes with age. Something we're so used to that we think it's a normal thing for a battery. It turns out it's a normal thing for a conventional battery. It's not a problem that flow batteries suffer from. Flow batteries also can be completely charged and completely discharged. They have no concept of reserved capacity. You don't have to baby them, it's kind of the opposite. They like working hard. They also have something that's quite important for those of us that, that enjoy our asset protection, which is they don't suffer from the risk of a thing called thermal runaway. Again, lithium batteries, one of the consequences of their high energy storage capacity is a capacity to also go into thermal runaway. If you put them in a fire, they go bang. But also, perhaps more subtly, if they're in an energy system that shorts out, they can deliver that fabulous amount of peak energy into a fault somewhere else in the system and that can actually result in, in a fire of an, in and of itself. So there are risks there. Now it turns out that flow batteries, as I mentioned, are very big with one exception, which is the one that Redflow makes. Redflow makes a flow battery that isn't shipping container sized, it's roughly bar fridge sized. And so you can put that device in places that other flow batteries fear to tread. And it means that those technology advantages have got new places that they can appear that haven't been previously feasible to have flow batteries appear in the world. The other thing I want to mention briefly from, this, from all these bullet points, and I'll come back to it at the end, is recyclability. One nice thing about flow batteries is they're actually highly recyclable devices in a way that is unusual for conventional batteries. And it's one of the deep things about conventional batteries is that they don't necessarily have a very simple or a very clean recycling story. Flow batteries are, are distinguished by exception in that regard, and I think that's kind of important. I just want to show you the fact that these flow batteries turn up in real world places. These are just a few real world examples of, of our flow batteries, the Red Flow ZBM flow battery, um, also known as a Z-Cell, turning up in real world places. There's an installation with a couple of them there on, on the left in a residential house here in Adelaide. There's an installation on the right there, which is six of them sitting in an off-grid house in Queensland, running perfectly well. These things are quite good off-grid. So the point is they exist in the real world, they work in the same sort of role that you might otherwise imagine you would use a lead acid battery or a lithium battery. So the day job of storing energy and retrieving it, that works just fine. That same day job works in other places. A strong suit for, for our flow batteries turn out to be in telecommunication deployments, replacing lead acid. One of the great unsung uses of batteries, we all see these new uses in our homes and our businesses and our grids, but lead acid batteries have been hiding away in telecommunications for decades. Every mobile phone site, pretty much without exception, has a set of lead acid batteries sitting in it for power availability, for the reasons that we all expect to put batteries now in our homes and businesses. But in telecommunication environments, often in hot, in hot countries and hot environments like the ASEAN region that we sit in, those lead acid batteries typically fall over in two or three years if they're being worked hard, and that's a role in which a flow battery can expect to be thumping away happily for a decade at least. So this is a very strong suit in terms of where flow batteries can wind up if you're small enough to get into those sites, and we are. And obviously, if you make something small, it's also very easy to make something big, right? And that's the point. You can't go the other way easily. If your device is enormous, you can't squeeze it into some small space very easily. But if your device is small, there's no problem building bigger ones by just deploying lots of those objects. Uh, this is a leaf that we've very much taken from Tesla's book. The fact that the Tesla cars that I'm a very happy owner of several of in our family all use l tiny lithium batteries. And, and Tesla's great, great bit of, of joy was to figure out that if you could work out how to put thousands of those in the bottom of a car, you could make something great. Same thing here. Modularity has, great deals, has a great deal of reward to it. And these are some commercial installations of these batteries. The one on the right, um, this is the installation at my office. There's a multi-tenanted office there that, that on a good day has got 60 people in various tenancies. 
and there's 450 kilowatt hours of flow batteries and a whole lot of Victron inverters and 100 kilowatts in total, most of which is floating over the car park of solar, doing the same thing in a business that you would otherwise want to do these days in your home. There's a few other installations there. One on the bottom left is actually doing, is actually doing um, tariff arbitrage and time shifting of energy. There's no solar on that building. It's actually an architecture firm here in Adelaide. They, in fact, move energy around to avoid peak tariff usage problems and to avoid an issue they had with insufficient power coming into a, a renovated building that they moved into. So they used the flow batteries to, to do peak shaving in a commercial environment. So the point is, these are real batteries and they do a real job. But you know, that's nice, right? So Simon's up here talking about fabulous flow batteries and how wonderful he thinks they are. And clearly I've got lots of reasons to think that. I think the technology is interesting and I like it a lot. Uh, but why don't you just use lithium, right? What's wrong with that? It's sexy, it comes in a variety of exciting colours and it seems to work as a battery. So why work any harder? Obvious question, reasonable question. And there are environments in which lithium is absolutely the right choice. And these are the two environments, right? If you've got a mobile application in the sense that you, it's a car, lithium is the thing that's got the punch to get the job done. And if you've got a consumer electronics application like a mobile phone, it's the only thing with the energy density to get the job done. So in those environments, you accept the compromises I briefly mentioned, and I'll come back and mention once more about lithium batteries, because they're the only animal that solves it. But in stationary energy storage, in putting energy storage in our homes, in our businesses, and in our grid, there are other alternatives. And it's important to appreciate that, and, and that's really the, the message I've got to give you today. I'm a huge fan of electric vehicles. As I mentioned, I, I, I'm a very happy owner of Tesla cars because they make the best ones. That's the first Tesla electric car that turned up in Australia. I privately imported it. It was a Californian spec car and drove it from Darwin to Adelaide in 2009. This is a fabulous use of lithium. I want to touch just briefly again on these, on these downsides though, because um, they're really quite significant. Lithium, all batteries in general, but lithium in particular, has these fascinating downsides. There is a challenge with recycling of lithium batteries. That challenge is largely one that we can ignore for the next eight to 10 years, and then we're going to, go, going to start to get the first round of lithium batteries really wearing out and winding up having to have something done with them. That's when that challenge might start growing. I mentioned before that deep cycling of batteries wears them out, conventional batteries. Again, we're used to it, but it's an important point. The harder you use a, a conventional battery, the more often you cycle it, the faster it dies. Its age is a function of how hard you work it. If it's on standby, it doesn't wear out. And if it's doing rock star tricks like short term high, volt, high power pulses into the grid, it doesn't wear out. It's a fabulous use for it. But if you drain it every day, you're going to kill it. Also, conventional batteries don't like getting hot. That graph on the right, lots of little dots on it. The point is the capacity, or sorry, the lifetime of conventional batteries decreases as the temperature that they are operating in rises, except for flow batteries. That top line where the lifetime is not decreasing at all, that's flow batteries in all their varieties. They don't suffer from, they don't, they don't get hot under, you know, they don't get flustered when they're hot. There is a disposal challenge with batteries, I'll come back to that later. And there is this, this genie in the bottle for lithium batteries that they can actually burn. You know, that, that's one of the, the lovely cars I quite like doing something that none of us want to see our car doing. And mobile phones, you know, we all, when we all travel on Qantas these days, you get told not to jam your phone in the seat back for a reason, which is that if you damage it, it's going to make a little fire. These are significant compromises, but we suffer them and we tolerate them for reasons of familiarity. There's also other significant challenges in our world. We have challenges with this thing called base load power. We also have arguably political challenges with the perception of what the problem is and therefore what the solution should be. You know, we can't solve a problem unless we agree what the problem actually is. And I find this a fascinating photograph, you know, a federal politician staring at a lump of coal as if that's the best thing they've seen all week. And the point about coal, of course, the, the unavoidable point about coal-fired power is, is that we've got this argument happening at a federal level about how we should keep existing power stations alive. It's a distraction. The base point is the existing ones are all going away. More, they're all disappearing around us. They're being closed. And we ain't building any new ones. And the reason we ain't building any new ones is straight economics. You can keep the old guy going but there's no economics in building a new one against the incredible economics of renewable energy sources. And it's no longer an issue about subsidy, right? You take the subsidies away, as I'll get to, it actually get the, the story gets stronger. You know, the subsidies now are about subsidising keeping the old coal-fired power stations alive. So the industry understands the point. The economics are not in favour of building new ones of these. We have what we have, but there's only one direction in terms of that stuff. And even the guys that stare at the coal agree these days that we aren't building any more of them. 
So what does that mean? It means we live in a world where the base load power that, that, that a certain generation of us might think was an axiomatic part of the power grid, right? There's always base load power. There will always be base load power. Well, it wasn't that long ago we didn't have an energy grid. And in the future, we will have an energy grid that doesn't necessarily have base load power. And that's where it starts to get interesting. We're actually in a transition where you don't want to fight the diminishment of base load power, you want to embrace it. You go from that picture on the left where there's an enormous amount of base load and there's, there's peaking, and inter, peaking and intermittent energy sources sitting there, to imagining a world where the gradual removal of that base load energy source set actually is an opportunity rather than a threat. There's also some tiny little arrows on the left-hand chart labelled FCAS, right? Frequency, um, frequency and, and stabilisation, frequency, frequency and ancillary services in the grid. That's the rock star trick that big lithium battery packs pull off to great, to great effect. That when there's a sudden shift in the energy mix on a grid, having a battery is a fantastic thing to do to paper over the cracks. There's something important here though. The major thing that the battery in Jamestown has done for us over the last, over the last summer has been in saving the grid from coal-fired power stations falling offline unexpectedly. This is actually quite deep. When you imagine a transition to a future grid where base load is diminishing and disappearing, then you get two things. You get variable renewables, wind and sun and all those other nice things, and you get dispatchable renewables, which is a nice mouthful phrase for energy storage, for time-shifted variable renewables. Now, here's a really deep point to think about. People talk about wind and sun, you know, it goes away and it comes back again, you know, surprise, surprise. It's not unpredictable, it's only variable, it is not unpredictable. In fact, you can predict the amount of energy you will generate from a solar plant with extreme accuracy. You can predict the amount of energy you'll generate from a wind farm with extreme accuracy. The Weather Bureau is good at this stuff, um, remarkably good. So that blue piece, that, that variable piece, is variable but highly predictable. So you know exactly how much storage you need to deliver from to fill in the gap. Because that storage in our future world will be highly distributed, there will be no big coal plants left, you don't get the risk of a single large loss of energy generation happening. The very thing that Tesla's battery in Jamestown solves, coal-fired power station falling offline unexpectedly, that problem will not exist to solve in that future grid because there won't be any of those things left. It's really quite deep. The problem that solves today will not be a permanent problem in that future grid. Instead, the problems turn into technology problems, hence you can see my interest in it. They, and the risks, in fact, turn into technology risks as well, into operating distributed fleets of energy generation, into making sure that happens securely and reliably, that you don't, in fact, get software failures being the large cause of grid failure, not hardware failures. So that brilliant battery installation at Hornsdale, its rock star trick, as I've mentioned, is saving the grid from itself. It's done such a good job of that in the last, last summer that it's eaten about half of the market in, in the process of saving the grid from itself, which actually means that the business case of building more of these is in fact being negatively impacted by how well this one's done it. You don't need that many of these to solve that, imme that immediate problem of coal-fired power stations failing. That 130 megawatt hour storage array only uses 9% of its capacity to pull off the Rockstar trick about 12 megawatt hours, designed to run for 10 minutes maximum and actually it does all the work in the first 60 seconds. It's a fantastic thing, but the rest of that is designed for time shifting on a long time base, something for which it is not special. So what else can you do for shifting energy on a long time base? What other choices do you have for doing that? You actually have lots of them, and in the right places there are a lot of better answers than just conventional batteries. The one we're all familiar with is Pumped hydro, and pumped hydro. Um, this is the, the Coltana. This is a, a, an image from the, the study for the Coltana uh, facility that we would like to see built in Port Augusta or in that neighbourhood. And it's using seawater just to prove the point. You don't necessarily need high rainfall environments. You can use salt water, not fresh water. You do. You do obviously still need a mountain. So this one's basically going to take water out of the water out and pump it uphill, and then pump the water back or let the water run downhill again. It's the easiest of batteries to explain. Your school student can explain why this works. You are converting potential to kinetic to potential to kinetic energy. It's the most fundamental way to store and to store and retrieve energy there is. It's a very simple, very obvious mechanism. But these are big and expensive and they take a long time to build. We already have a big expensive one that took a long time to build, Snowy Hydro. 
and we're all aware that Snow Hydro 2 is coming, I think that's a pretty good idea as a part of the solution because the thing already exists, you might as well upgrade it to pump water back uphill again. That makes complete sense. The only thing I don't understand actually about the diagrams of this is they're talking about building new, new pipes to pump it back uphill. The ones that already do this stuff in the world actually just run the turbines backwards. I don't quite understand why you don't do that here. But the point is, it makes sense, but if you read the documentation about Snowy Hydro 2.0, they, they agree, you know, they say, and it's rational and it's obvious, that only solves a part of the problem. If you were to solve the whole problem with hydro, you'd need to build a Snowy Hydro 3.0 and 4.0 and 5.0 as well. This is a component of the solution, it's not all of it. It's a great component. Here's a deep thing about hydro schemes, right? Hydro schemes, especially the snowy one, it's water, it's lovely. You know, you pump water up and down hills, that's nice and easy, no environmental impact, right? Well, that used to be Lake Pedder in the 1970s before it got flooded to turn into a hydro scheme in Tasmania. One of the more famous examples in Australia of environmental destruction in, in the process of generating electricity. My point is this, all energy storage schemes have an environmental impact, all of them. Hydro is no exception. The good thing about Snowy Hydro is we've already busted that terrain, we might as well make use of it. But we aren't manufacturing any more mountains and so the number of new hydro schemes where you don't happen to have a spare mountain and a community prepared to turn the mountain, to put a lake on top of the mountain, mean that it can only be a component of the solution. A big one, but a component. There are other ways to store energy and retrieve it in scale. 1414 is another organisation here at this event who is storing energy in the phase change of a material, in the phase change of silicon, making silicon so hot that it melts. Storing energy in phase changes is another fundamental use of high school physics that's an incredibly sensible way to store and retrieve energy as well. It's another very, very sensible way to do that. The strong suit of thermal storage in particular is it's easy to make heat. You just start firing mirrors at something until it gets so hot that it melts. And industrial processes in the world need about half of the world's energy to deliver that energy as heat directly. So if you already have heat, you've already done half the job. So this can be a big part of the future use of dispatchable renewables in the world as well. So we've already got two nice diversifications from just using conventional batteries. Surprise, surprise, the third one that I quite like is flow batteries for all the reasons I've mentioned earlier. But now let me just get you to look at flow batteries in a slightly different way. The point about flow batteries is that the way they work, the application cycle they serve is actually in effect identical to pumped hydro. What you do with a flow battery is you can charge a flow battery up, you can turn it off, the exact equivalent of having pumped water uphill into a lake and then shut the turbine down, waiting for a future point at which you need to deliver the energy back again. There's no loss of energy in that system while it's on standby and then you can boot the flow batteries back up at 30 seconds notice a day later, a week later, a month later, a year later and deliver 100% of that energy back into the grid later. So it's exactly like pumped hydro but in a box and you don't need a mountain. You can also do it at whatever size you need, all the way from a bar fridge size back up to grid scale. No risk of thermal runaway and a strong recycling story. And that's really the, the message I'm coming to is, is actually about recycling as an interesting challenge for us as we do this stuff. I won't read all of those words. This is actually a testimonial we had from our, 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 one of our larger customers who's building our, using our batteries to build energy systems. They're a New Zealand company called Hitech and their CTO, Derek Gaeth, is building these systems to deploy across Pacific Island nations to build energy systems to replace lead acid and diesel generators. He's bought our batteries for all the reasons I've mentioned, all the reasons why they're technically better than lead acid and lithium. But the important thing is the last paragraph here, and I will read this, he says, we believe there are still questions about the safe disposal and recycling of lithium batteries at their end of life, which could be a particular issue in the Pacific Islands, where recycling costs can be very high. Red flow batteries are made of components that are easily recycled or reused, which means this is not a problem. Now there's two points about this, and they're, they're a bit deep. These are very recyclable batteries. We make them out of plastic. The plastic is recyclable, conventional plastic and the electrolyte in them can be pulled out and reused. It doesn't degrade, it can go into the next battery. So there's an easy recycling story. There is a hard recycling story with a lot of conventional batteries, including especially lithium ones. And here's the trouble. Starting a decade from now with a hell of a lot of lithium in the world, if you're in a, if you're in a, 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 a third world nation, or even if you're in a first world one that's on a budget, if recycling is too expensive or too complicated, it doesn't happen, the stuff just gets thrown away, it gets dumped, it winds up in a landfill somewhere. 
You might not get away with that so easily in Australia, but, but in the Pacific or in Africa, if it's too expensive, someone digs a hole and buries it. And you know, I don't mind as a human being having a bit of fluoride in my water, it seems to do good things to my teeth, but I don't really want to be drinking lithium. That's a genuine issue for us. One of the things that we need to be careful about as we move into this sustainable energy future, replacing baseload power with dispatchable generation, and I think that is absolutely where we are heading, that die is cast, is that we as a society don't actually follow saving our environment from coal with destroying it with an environmental disaster around recycling enormous quantities of conventional batteries. And that's really the message I'm going to leave you with, that as we head to a world with dispatchable renewables running at grid scale, remember that for every problem there is not a single hammer and it's never striking a single nail. We can absolutely thrive in a world with a diminishing fleet of base load power generators. We have to, but we also can, right? This is actually a great thing for us to be heading towards. That future, as I've mentioned, is going to be a software-mediated future. We have a diverse array of energy storage mechanisms that we're going to see in the grid. That diversity is an interesting technical challenge, and there are a number of us that enjoy interesting technical challenges. There's no perfect answer for all situations here. And the deep thing, though, is the scale involved is massive. You know, I, I, I remember when, when Tesla's battery in Jamestown was first announced, some of the naysayers said, oh, you know, it can only solve 1% of the grid storage problem. I look at that as, as an entrepreneur and say, fantastic, 99% of it's left to sell. Right? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. All large journeys start with a single step, and that's a hell of a good step. So the ultimate scale here is industrially massive. Replacing all that generation with, with dispatchable renewables is a fantastic challenge. It's also a great opportunity for all of us, and I think it's going to be a great future for us to walk into. Let's just make sure that we don't leave a recycling disaster in its wake. Thank you very much.